All right, let me uh, open up with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for our time today, uh, for the opportunity to look at Isaiah 53 uh, in the New Testament, uh, particularly as we saw it with Acts, 5, or Acts 8. Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, give us a clear understanding of your word, uh, and that with a clear understanding that, it, um, that we might apply it to our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as I uh, prayed... We're going to look at uh, various passages that we find Isaiah 53 in the New Testament. So uh, let me uh, start off with uh, reading Isaiah 53, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. uh, And then from there, we'll look at uh, several passages in the New Testament uh, that have Isaiah 53. Uh, So taking a look at that, Isaiah 53, uh, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and within his wounds, or with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Okay. Uh, so, as, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at uh, just the passages in the New Testament that, uh, that quote uh, Isaiah 53. How many do you think there are, by the way? How many passages do you think there are in the New Testament that quote Isaiah 53? Seven? Seven? Okay. Almost, sort of. Yes and no. It could be, it, it's actually, I, I think it's seven, but uh, it could actually be seven or eight. And the reason for eight is because it's found in Mark. Why don't, why don't we turn, all turn over to that. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Or, or Mark chapter 15, sorry. And can someone read verse 28 for me? Mark chapter 15, verse 28. <laughs> yes, Mark 15, verse 28, please. Yes. And the, and the scripture was fulfilled. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's in the brackets. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, no um, okay, yours is in the brackets. Because uh, some of your Bibles, it, it won't have it in there at all. So the point was, uh, that's, why, that's the number eight version. Um, Matt, or Mark chapter 15, verse 28 is just like what we saw with Acts chapter 8. Um, and it's, it's found in the King James Version. It's just not found in a majority of the other uh, passages. Or, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I saw Chang walk through it. My, my thoughts just completely... Uh, okay. Um, Yeah, uh, the different versions. Only King James Version has uh, Mark fifteen twenty eight. 28. Uh, it's just because, again, based on a different set of manuscripts. Uh, and those manuscripts tend to be a little bit later in date. So the very earliest manuscripts aren't going to have that. 
Uh, it is seven. Seven passages in the New Testament that specifically quote from Isaiah 53. Uh, and so let's, let's take a look at these because I think it will be very helpful for us. And, and so we're going to read a lot of the scripture uh, as well because we're going to read those passages that quote uh, Isaiah 53. So the first one is from Matthew chapter 8. So let's go to Matthew chapter 8 verses 14 to 17. Matthew chapter 8 verses 14 to 17. Uh, and this is what we read. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she arose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. And then verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. Now what's interesting is that here's a passage that talks about this physical illness. Right? This physical illness uh, and... Here you have Matthew using Isaiah 53, quoting it. He took our illness and bore our diseases. Well, some people, actually there's a lot of people that take it in this sort of way. And I'm going to quote to you a book. And I'm just going to uh, tell you the title of the book. And then I'll tell you who the person actually said this. The title of the book is Becoming a Better You, page 45 and page 114. Okay? Uh, and so the title of this book, you'll, you'll find, uh, reads this way. Uh... Maybe Alzheimer's disease runs in your family genes, but don't succumb to it. Instead, say every day, my mind is alert. I have clarity of thought. I have a good memory. Every cell in my body is increasing and getting healthier. And then he goes on. If you'll rise up in your authority, you can be the one to put a stop to the negative things in your family line. Start boldly declaring, God is restoring health unto me. I am getting better every day in every way. Yes, I think I heard an amen. Um, that's actually from Joel Osteen. And that, so I, I know for a lot of you, you may never actually read his works, but I wanted to give you that quote because uh, here what he's trying to do is, is, is say that, yeah, Isaiah, and quoted by Matthew, uh, illness, we should be able to overcome our illnesses. We should be able to overcome our diseases. That's actually not the point here so much as what, Matthew wants to alert us to is that in this kind of suffering, physical illness, it's not normal. It's not normal. It's, it's not the way things are supposed to be. Very often we kind of say, oh, well, physical illness, it's just, this is just how it is. Actually, by quoting this, what, he's, what, what Matthew is showing us is that with the coming of Christ, he's come to defeat sin. Yes, he's come to defeat sin because sin is the underlying root of all of this physical illness. When we get to heaven, there is no more physical illness. And so physical illness is not normal, and we shouldn't embrace it in the sense of saying, oh yeah, this is good. Uh, physical illness is not good. It's not good. And so Christ actually came to overcome that, to defeat that. And you know, as, as one person was quoting uh, this, this uh, other uh, woman, he was saying that, um, how are you feeling? Because uh, often this, this lady would uh, have good days and bad days because she has a chronic illness. And uh, this, this, this pastor, uh, the response he got from her was, nothing that the resurrection cannot defeat. Nothing that the resurrection cannot defeat. And so the idea is that that physical illness is not normal. It's not supposed to be that way. And we're not supposed to embrace that physical illness and say, oh, this is good. Give me more physical illness. Uh, that's not, and, and, and there are some people who will take it in that direction. Right? It's not normal. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And so the point there is that with the coming of Christ, that he's come to overcome. He's come to defeat even physical illness so that we would, in the resurrection life, uh, finally you know, be done away with that. Be done away with illness, be done away with death, be done away with all of that. That's how it's supposed to be. Until then, yes, we have to endure, we're enduring it, but we have that hope that there is a terminus, there is an end point to it. And many times when you have that end point, it actually gives you a lot of hope. If you think that it's, there's, there's no end in sight, it becomes very frustrating. It becomes very depressing. But if you know there's an end in sight, you know, oh, wait a minute. The Lord has come to overcome it. There is a time when I will no longer have to endure it. Right? And, and, and so this is what we're seeing here because this whole, uh, this whole chapter, Matthew 8, talking about overcoming, for instance, the centurion, he has faith. Right? And, and there you have this Roman soldier, uh, again, very, very 
uh, fascinating overcoming that, overcoming physical illness, overcoming cultural differences, overcoming uh, ethnic differences, uh, overcoming all these things that's being described in Matthew 8. And so the coming of Christ using, uh, using Matthew 8, using Isaiah 53... Uh, overcoming what it's not supposed to be like, uh, the, sort of the normalcy of it in the resurrection life. So we see that with Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8. Also, we take a look at Luke 22. Luke 22 uh, is another passage that describes uh, or quotes from Isaiah 53. And I'm going to read uh, Luke 22, verses 35 to 38. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, there are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Well, taking a look at this passage here, and then Mark chapter 15, 21 to 32 also describes this, but as I said, verse 28 isn't there. Uh, it's been, uh, it seems like in later manuscripts inserted. Uh, and so here, it, in, in talking about, they were, they're, the disciples were very slow in understanding, right? Slow in uh, what is to come. Uh, and, and oftentimes clinging to their uh, hopes that Jesus was going to re- uh, restore a physical nation at that very moment. Uh, and so he quotes Isaiah 53, verse 12, that he was numbered with the transgressors, so that instead of introducing the kingdom and power and glory, instead he's going to suffer humiliation and shame and be put to death. He had been kept safe by God, but this preservation was going to be withdrawn, and men would do whatever they would want to with him. And this would be the case for the disciples as well. They had lacked nothing because they had been with him and he had sent them forth. But now they were going to be identified with the rejected and crucified Messiah and would look to God for themselves in a way that they had not done before. Okay, so, with, again, with Luke, it, it, it changes their entire perspective of who is this Jesus figure. Right? He's not what they expected at all. Uh, we're actually going to unpack that a little bit more during the sermon. But uh, as, as they weren't expecting this, right, that this, this political savior, this, this nationalistic savior, this is not what they imagined. It completely upends the way they think. Um, let, let's take a look at John also. Okay, we've got like four, four or five more passages to look at. John chapter 12, verses 37 to 41. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may have that you may become sons of light. The unbelief of the people, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still had not believed in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. Uh, Here, John is quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 1. Uh, And so, but though he had done many miracles before them, they did not believe him. Uh, And the idea here is that who's going to believe our report? Why would they believe it? Because, again, you have to remember this messianic figure, this messianic figure is not the kind of messianic figure that you would expect. He didn't come, when you look at him, he didn't come and appear that he had the strength, the know-how, the wisdom, the charisma. He wasn't the kind of figure that you would expect is going to accomplish this sort of great salvation. He's not what you would expect. And so this idea that he was going to suffer, as, as he, the more and more he kept saying, I am going to suffer, the more and more all of the people started to say, this doesn't make any sense. And and, and suddenly, this no longer becomes an attractive message. That the Messiah had to suffer, that the Messiah had to die, that the Messiah had to die in our place. It becomes clearer and clearer as uh, the Gospels go on to the very end, when Jesus, in fact, has to die for his people. That, That voluntary substitution is a concept that really does not make any sense. Why would anyone voluntarily die, suffer an eternity of punishment for me? 
that's just something that the disciples did not expect. Instead, what were they saying? They were saying things like, shall we bring fire down from heaven? Right? These people that are coming up against us, shall we, uh, shall we put them down? Shall we use force? Shall we use our brute force in order to put them down and show them who's boss? That's what the disciples kept thinking, right? You have uh, the brothers, James and John, arguing over the fact that who's going to be greater, right? Peter saying, yeah, there's nothing that's going to stop me. I'm going to be with you at all times. Yet all of his disciples completely misunderstanding Jesus' mission, why he came. The humility of, again, voluntarily dying for you. Here, here's a concept that, that we, we have to understand. Voluntary substituting your life. See, the thing is, everybody has to die. Right? Everybody has to die. That's a consequence of sin. Jesus did not have to die. When we talk about a true voluntary death for you, because you, know, you hear that all the time, uh, especially, uh, particularly with romantic relationships. Oh, I'll die for you. Right? I'll do anything for you. I'll die for you even. There's nothing that would stop me from you. Right? You hear that kind of stuff, but... In fact, it's not really that voluntary because in the end, you're going to die, right, as a consequence of sin in general. But only Jesus, who did not have to die, and yet he voluntarily submits his life to death for you, right? And here then is this whole concept of of Jesus saying, I, you want to know what real love looks like? Here's what real love looks like. I didn't have to stay up on the cross. I didn't have to get pummeled by the Roman soldiers. I didn't have to endure any of that. Voluntarily speaking, I will endure all of that, but that's not even the worst of it, right? When he's in this perfect relationship with his father, enjoying perfect bliss, and yet he's saying, I'm willing to get cut off. I'm willing to get kicked out of the house so that you can be brought into the house. Who does that? Who does that? Who does something like that, right? And he does that for you. He does that willingly, submitting himself to do that. That is incredible. I mean, that's when we talk about what is love. There it is. He's willing to do that for you. And, and, and the problem is so often we fail to really embrace the beauty behind that. That voluntarily he substitutes himself for you. Right? So we see that uh, with, with Matthew, uh, Luke, and John. The, the whole concept of, of, of what he's going after here. Uh, and, and again, the arm of the Lord... Uh, The arm of the Lord is just meant to signify power, the power of God. The power of God doesn't look like Jesus. He looks meek. He looks humble, dying on a cross. That doesn't look all that powerful. Again, not what you would expect. And yet through that very death comes your death to sin, that, that you no longer have to be afraid and fearful of that death. This is, again, the beauty behind what Christ does here. Uh, we, we looked at Acts 8, right? We looked at Acts 8 when uh, the fact that here this Ethiopian, this Ethiopian is, is uh, wanting, he, he's reading Isaiah 53, right? He's reading Isaiah 53 uh, as, as an Ethiopian eunuch. He goes to uh, the Jerusalem temple and realizes he's not accepted. He's not allowed to worship with everyone else. Being a eunuch disqualifies him. We also see the fact that being an Ethiopian, Right, somewhat uh, here, essentially a black man, right? A black man, uh, this this African man who is searching. Uh, he's he's the second highest ranked person in all of uh, the Ethiopian kingdom, and yet he's still feeling like I don't have something. Uh, I'm still missing something, despite all the success he has, despite all the riches he has, despite all the authority he has. I mean, in a sense, he has it all, and yet he still feels like he's lacking something, and so he goes to the Jerusalem temple. And there, he's looking for God, and he's not allowed to worship. So he's coming back home, and there Philip is is sent to him. And Philip, what does he do? He brings the gospel message, and he explains Isaiah 53. Again, the whole point of that. Who would voluntarily submit themselves to suffer for someone like me? And, And the Ethiopian eunuch is just completely floored by this. Who would do this for me? Because again, as a eunuch, he is not someone who's going to be able to have children. And yet it describes in Isaiah 56, just a couple chapters later, that yes, you will not be dry. You will have a numerous, bund of, uh, abundant number of children. Right? It completely changes the way everything is to be understood. 
breaking down these uh, ethnic barriers, breaking down right, the way we relate to one another. And Philip is bringing the gospel in this way, and it's just completely, uh, just a completely radical message that an Ethiopian eunuch can be a Christian, be a part of the kingdom of God. Because through a Jewish understanding, it's like, well, no, this, I don't think this works. But suddenly, with the coming of Christ, it changes everything. And so that's what we see with uh, Acts 8. If we go on Romans 10, verses 11 to 21, we, we also see uh, this message here. Uh, in uh, Romans 10, 11 to 21, um, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. Uh, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, then, will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Right, there's Isaiah 53 passage. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask you, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out all the earth and the words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those whom are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have not found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Okay, well, what's the, what's the point of all this? Well, the larger context from Romans 9 through 11, essentially, the whole point is, is God's word faithful? Because when you look out at Israel, suddenly Israel, many of them are not believing. And so the question is, is God's word uh, faithful? Is it reliable? Uh, Romans 9, 6 says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. So now suddenly the shift to the Gentiles and you're wondering, well, if all of us as Gentiles come to believe God, is the word of God going to fail us? So, and, and so this whole question is, is it failing Israel? Is it going to fail the Gentiles? This whole question of, is God's word going to fail? Who's going to believe this message? Again, this whole, the power of the message, the power of the gospel, can it bring about a change? And we're actually going to talk about this whole aspect of change, a conversion to change by looking at uh, Acts 9, verses 4 and 5. So when we, when we understand here, who's going to believe this message? Because again, this message is rather incredible. It's an incredible message that really just doesn't make any sense. Who would want to love me, and, and, and you know, this, is, this is a point that's, that's been made by others, but this whole idea, um, there's a famous playwright who writes, in describing hell, he says that hell is basically somebody who, uh, you're, you're basically all alone in a room, and everyone just stares at you, right? It, what, what it's getting at is this whole idea that all of my inadequacies, my anxieties come to light. Everyone is just going to stare at me, look at me, and, 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 you know, what are you like? Are you enough? And, and part of this whole notion of being loved by God is this idea that you know what you're like. All of you know what you're like. You know the deep and sinful thoughts that you have. You know all the sins that you commit when you're all alone. You know all of those things, the thoughts, the actions, all of that, the, the, the things that you say when no one's around, the things that you mutter under your breath. All of these things you know. And, you know, to the point that, you know, if you think about between spouses even, it, or, or, you know, between with your parents, right? How many, how many uh, kids will say they, they don't want to tell everything to their parents? Why? They're afraid, right? Same thing in, in terms of spouses. If you tell your spouse, you don't want to say everything, right? You don't want to say everything to your best friend. You don't want to say anything to your, uh, to your uh, whomever. Because the idea of someone knowing exactly what you're like, everything that you're about, all the way you think, all the way the things that you've done, the whole notion, and yet still be loved, is, is a concept that is very, very frightening, right? But, but what we see is what uh, the gospel message is saying that it's not what you've done. The gospel message comes to you and says, it's not what you've done, it's not your past. And we see this with, uh, especially Paul's conversion. It's not your past, but it's this whole notion of saying, do you understand that, that this message completely changes you? Christ changes you. Right? Uh, and that to be known and yet to be fully loved. 
right? Something like that is, is so uh, awe-inspiring. And it makes you say, wait a minute. What other message teaches that? Because every other religion is going to say what? Well, I need to do X, Y, and Z in order to get to a certain point. I need to be good enough. Christianity says, no, you're never going to be good enough. And that's what you need to realize and embrace. Who will hear this message? Who will understand this message? Who's going to embrace something like this? Right? This message that Christ has come, to, because you're not good enough, Christ has come and you simply need to trust what Christ has done. This is an incredible message that the world needs to hear and understand. So we see this with, uh, with, with Romans, and then lastly, with 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 25, and specifically verses 22 and 24. Uh, let me read there. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For, this, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his footsteps. And here it is. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and then so forth. Here's a passage in talking about unjust suffering. Unjust suffering, right? I mean, how often we think, well, you know, what they did to me and it wasn't fair. It doesn't feel fair. And so often our first impulse is to fight back. But here, Peter uses Isaiah 53 to describe the fact that Jesus, right, Jesus, suffering the greatest injustice that could ever be imaginable. He did no wrong. He did no wrong. There was no um, sin, deceit found in his mouth, and yet he endured. But it's not the kind of endurance of, of, of just, you know, oftentimes we just kind of say, bite your lip down, right? Uh, be stoic about it. I'm going to endure it. That's not what this is about, right? Uh, you see, so often he endures greatly. He cries. Jesus cries a lot. He's very emotional. Very emotional. The kind of, again, not what you would expect in a savior. Not what you would expect in a messianic figure. He's a crier, right? There's all this emotion in him. Things that you don't associate with someone who's strong and tough. And yet that's exactly what we find with Jesus. And he endures all this as partly as an example to us, right? As an example to us, but also because we don't endure very well for us. For us as an example, but also in our place. And, and this, again, reminds us of the gospel. This is what heals us because he endures for us. Because if all Jesus is is an example for us to follow, this is going to destroy you. Because you're going to live your whole life trying to live up to some example. An example that you're never going to be able to do. You're never going to be able to do it. And all that pressure that's just going to mount on you, I'm just not good enough. But that's a lack of understanding of the gospel. Jesus endured for us. For us. In our place. So that because he has healed us, now in response... We will endure just as he did. It is completely the other way around. The difference between the gospel and the difference between the gospel and um, a works-based religion. Right? Completely the other way around. And the reality is, as much as we like to talk about grace, the reality is oftentimes we find ourselves still succumbing to a works-based religion. Let me be good enough. Let me do enough in order for God to accept me, in order for me to be okay. And we're going to expand on this a little bit more during uh, the sermon as we look at uh, Acts 9. Okay, so let's, uh, let's close in prayer then. Uh, Father, thank you for our time and study as we uh, t uh, looked at Isaiah 53 and, and uh, the way in which it's quoted uh, throughout the New Testament. Uh, Lord, our time is short. 
Uh, but we pray still it's uh, beneficial. Uh, we pray that uh, that gospel word, uh, as it's implanted in our hearts, that it would uh, sprout forth and, and uh, the spirit would, would cause it to grow uh, mightily. Uh, it may even look like a bamboo uh, in the sense that uh, year one, year two, year three, uh, we see nothing. And yet year four, suddenly it sprouts 96 feet in the air. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, this is something that uh, your word would sprout greatly in our hearts, uh, that it would result in a, great, uh, a greater love for you. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.